Okay, welcome everybody. This is, uh, these are the Frankie Lectures in the Humanities at the Whitney Humanities Center. I'm Paul North. And um, the series is called The Value of Marx's Capital. It is a companion to an undergraduate seminar that I'm giving at Yale and the students are here in attendance or will be. And it's also in concert with a new translation that's being done by my colleague, Paul Ryder at OSU. And in addition, we're calling a critical student edition, a critical reading edition in which I'm co-writing the notes. So we're exploring the book together. And before we start, I need to thank a few people. The Frankie lectures are made possible by the generosity of Richard and Barbara Frankie and are intended to present important topics in the humanities to a wide and general audience. I would like to thank Alex Kaplan, the director of the Whitney Humanities Center for making this possible um, and metaphysically possible. For those who made it organizationally possible, Sandra Malan Bowles and Leanna Hirschfeld Crowen. And for those, meaning one person, Audrey Leak, who's making it technologically possible. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you to everyone. We are going to start with our presentation from our speaker, and then we will turn to the audience for questions. Please hold your questions. When I give you the signal, you can start putting them in the chat and we'll go through them that way. I like to start with a quote from the speaker. So this is a quote from a great book, Marx's Temporalities from 2013, um, from a section on laws and tendencies. I'm gonna read this quote. Marx tried to delineate tendencies in the same way that a painter begins to paint the background before painting the subjects of the picture. The historical tendencies are sketched out in order better to give evidence of the nature of the counter tendencies. By the middle of the 1860s, at least, Marx was decisively opposed to the quote, idolatry of the rigidity of laws in history, unquote. Just as capitalism is not digging its own grave by itself, equally communism is not an ontological dimension already produced in capital. It is necessary rather to work in the space of the difference between law and tendency. This is a quote from our speaker, Massimiliano Tomba, and I'm gonna give the screen over to my colleague, Paul Ryder, to introduce him. Uh, thanks, Paul. And uh, Massimiliano, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Massimiliano Tamba is a professor of politics and also the history of consciousness at the University of California at Santa Cruz and that history of consciousness program uh, is such a wonderful thing, uh, really a legendary program and uh, it's great that he's, he's there. Uh, he is the author of a number of books on, on Marx and, and other topics, uh, most recently a book entitled, titled Insurgent Universality, An Alternative Legacy of Modernity, published in 2019. Paul mentioned his Marx's Temporalities book, uh, which was published in 2013. He's also written a book about Kant and Benjamin and a book on uh, Bruno Bauer's uh, political categories. He, a lot of his thinking turns on uh, temporality, historiography, time in, in Marx, and uh, he has a number of articles that, that deal with, with those topics. Uh, I hope that this has suggested um, something about how broadly interested he is in Marx and how open his scholarship is. A lot, a lot of people, we were talking about this earlier, uh, Paul and I and Massimiliano, how a lot of people uh, claim that uh, they, have they are interested in really opening things up now in this era of post-sectarian Marxist criticism, and yet uh, they cling mostly to a certain idea, perspective, way of reading. And there's, there is a real openness in Massimiliano, Massimiliano's scholarship um, that I, I certainly appreciate a great deal. Um, so thank you so much for being part of this, Massimiliano. Uh, it's, it's great to meet you and, and to have you here. Uh, the title of the presentation today is nothing to expect but a tanning bodies at work. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, wanna, I want to start with the two 
anecdote. One is a personal and uh, it concerns my youth. When I was a 14, my, my father basically sent me during the summer, sent me to work in a, in a small factory in my, in my village. And uh, after a couple of days, I was there. <clears throat> I was uh, looking at my watch because uh, it was uh, 4.30, almost 5 p.m. At 5 p.m. is the, the working day is over. I was looking for that time. And then a, another worker, a colleague, uh, look at me and uh, he told me, what are you doing? Put your watch back into your pocket. If the boss sees you that you are looking at your watch, he starts screaming like a crazy. I said, oh, wow. That was my second day and I was 14. And the second, the second anecdote uh, is, is about another guy uh, whose name is uh, Luciano. And, and once he had to introduce himself and he, he, he was a real factory worker. So for me, it was just the experience of a one, sum, one summer. And uh, he introduced himself by saying, uh, I have worked for 30 years in that factory. Then he's, uh, he's silent himself. I, just, I think the light is not just a second, sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry for that. Um, and and yeah, and then and then he said, uh, actually, actually, it's not that I worked. Actually, he said, I have been worked for 30 years. So why did I start with uh, these uh, two anecdotes? Because uh, the first one, it shows me at that time, I couldn't understand exactly what was going on. But the first time about looking at my watch, uh, it shows me what? That the time when you are in a factory, time doesn't belong to you. And, uh, and the second example, the second anecdote, the body that uh, has been worked it shows that even the body maybe doesn't belong to you. So when you are a factory worker, you, you sell your labor power, but unfortunately for you, your body is attached to that commodity labor power. And, uh, and at that point, even the body is not really yours you have to be subjected to a very specific discipline. And not only, very often you have to be subjected to a kind of a very noxious labor that really consume uh, your, your body. Uh, in the, but in that second example, there is even something more because uh, in the transition from I have worked and to I have been worked. I see the transition from active to passive. And the passive form that is very present in, in Capital Volume One is very tricky because immediately, immediately forces us to think Whose agency is that? When I say I have been worked, who is the agent? Who, whose agency is that? So, and this is the starting point of my of my presentation. I wanna I want to share my screen with you. So, when Marx. Uh, wants to describe or to point out this agent, he 
uses Gothic images. In these cases, uh, is uh, is Dante, uh, and uh, and is the is the hell, is the inferno, and and Marx cites Dante, and he writes. I want to read from my, yeah. He writes, with a working day ranging from 12 to 14 or 15 hours, night labor, irregular meal times, and meals mostly taken in the work rooms themselves, pestilent with the phosphorus, Dante, would have found the worst horrors and his inferno surpassed in this industry. This is how he presents the factory as a, as a hell, as a, an inferno. And then, as I say, we move into these gothic images. My question is, I want to repeat my question, whose agency is that? Who is the agent? of I have been worked. And Marx, describes the capital as a, as a dead labor, which vampire-like lives only by sucking living labor. Marx read Polidori, this book that was published in 1819. And he uses the image of the, of the vampire many, many times. For example, another citation, the vampire thirst, thirst for the living blood of, of labor. Or again, the vampire will not let the worker go while there remains a single muscle or drop of blood to be exploited. So the language is very, is very physical, corporeal, mm? muscle, blood, and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and capital is described as a vampire. Sometimes Marx uses a different image. It's not a vampire, but it's the werewolf. And uh, and Marx is talking about the werewolf like werewolf, werewolf hunger for sur surplus labor. He also describes the factory and the condition of uh, labor in the capitalist mode of production as the torture of a Sisyphus. Other images, this is again the, the it's not Dante, but in Dante, you can find this uh, torture of Sisyphus as a form of a punishment. Again, another image that Marx used, I'm just going through the, the, all these different images. Another image that Marx uses is the uh, Juggernaut. Uh, and he writes the Juggernaut wheels of a capital. And these are Juggernaut, this uh, car is a kind of a huge wagon bearing an image of an Hindu god. Uh, the term Juggernaut was also used uh, in, uh, in literature. For example, uh, it was used to describe the character of uh, Mr. Hyde in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, Marx read all these uh, kind of uh, novels and uh, he used uh, all of them uh, to describe or to give some images of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the capitalist mode of production. Um, he also, another citation now, in order to, I wanna go deeper in, uh, in uh, Marx's considerations of these uh, bodies at work. Marx is 
describes the factory in terms of, uh, and the bodies of the workers in terms of, uh, say, I, I quote, physical and mental degradation. He's talking about the torture of overwork. He also writes that uh, factory work exhausts the nervous system of the worker and confiscate, confiscates every atom of a freedom, both in bodily and in intellectual activity. I think, I think this is important. So Marx is aware that uh, labor is consuming both the body and the soul your body and your intel intellect. And uh, now, now the question is, uh, why is Marx using all these images? What does he want to provoke? Uh, one can say, ah, is it in order to provoke a kind of a moral indignation? I'm not sure about that, maybe a little but not really in my opinion. Why? Because Marx doesn't represent the capitalist. I always say it, so far, capitalist mode of production or capital. Marx doesn't represent the capitalist as an evil monster. Actually, in the, in the in the preface of a capital volume one, when he's talking about the capitalist, he says that he considers the capitalist a personified category. When Marx uses the term monster, and he uses the term, he uses this term in order to describe the capitalist machine or, yeah, the, the machine, which Marx portrayed as, a, I quote, a mechanical monster whose body fills the old factory and whose demonic power burst forth in the fast and feverish will of his countless working organs. So the, the monster is the mechanical monster that Marx describes also as a body whose organs are the workers. And there is a power and Marx describes this power as a demonic power. So it's interesting the fact that he uses all these uh, images, these uh, concepts, evil, monster, demonic, in order to describe machinery and not in order to describe the capitalist as a person, as a subject. For that reason, I don't think there is a, a or yes, is there, but it's not a central. Uh, there is not real moral condemnation of the capitalist mode of production. There is something more. Some, we have to go a little bit deeper to see what is at stake in, in Capital Volume 1. So the capitalist is not an evil agent. Just in order to provoke a little bit of discussion, I am not sure that the Marx would have shared some of the moral condemnation on the 1% that uh, was very common and is still common in, 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 in in Occupy, he would have agreed for sure with the 
political and social motivation, but maybe not with the uh, with the with the moralistic language. Maybe is a is a just a something that we can discuss later. Because as I say, for Marx, the capitalist is a is a is a personified category. The agency that was our first question, whose agency is that when we are talking about I have been worked. And the agency is uh, according to Marx uh, is a, or the subject is in Marx is the automatic subject. This is a Marx term. And what is the automatic subject is a value, is a process, is a valorization of a value. Very quickly, what is a valorization of value? What is the process of a valorization? I can only we can we can go back in the in the in the in the discussion if you want. The only thing I want to say is uh, that when we are talking about uh, uh, valorization, the the crucial category or concept is is time, and that was my second anecdote. My first anecdote. The second was of body. The first one was of time. The, the central concept is time. So basically for Marx, a value is a, is a socially necessary labor time objectified in you know, one commodity. But what does it mean? It means that the value is not the time that the, you usually, you, you actually require in order to produce a certain commodity. One capitalist maybe needs three hours in order to produce uh, this pen. Um, another capitalist, because uh, he has machines, he can produce the same pen in one hour. Mark's point is uh, this, the value is exactly the same because the value is socially necessary labor time objectified in the commodity. So a kind of an average. And, uh, and this is interesting because, uh, because, uh, because uh, it allows us to understand a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, again, we can talk about that in the, in the, in the discussion. So, but the phenomenon is how different capitals work in the global market and in competition with each other. So in a certain way, for a capital that is uh, extremely, or can use labor that is extremely productive because it has machine, it can produce things, one pen in one hour, but in order to have this advantage, the advantage is uh, it can produce things uh, faster, quicker, than the socially necessary labor time, what is necessary is that the, in the entire society, there are other capitalists which cannot use machine. Or maybe they can, but they don't have the money to buy the machine. So capitalism is not an homogeneous system. Capitalism requires differences in productivity. And, 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 and these differences are necessary in order to gain and realize what Marx calls extra surplus value. So in a certain way, my point is, uh, if you want to understand, I'm working in California. If you want to understand the Silicon Valley, you need to understand Foxconn in China. You need to understand how these two systems are connected, are part of the same configuration, how high-tech tech, high tech production is combined with the gigantic factories in which you have a thousand and thousand of workers. And I think Marx uh, allows us to understand this kind of a relationship. 
that is, I think, very crucial today because otherwise the risk is to think, and this is my last provocation for the discussion, otherwise the risk is to think that automation can get rid of human labor. I think it's not the case. Why? Because capital requires differences in productivity. Capital is allergic to the, what Marx called the generalization of a technological innovation. We can talk about that. Um, um, then there is another dimension that is important to emphasize in, uh, in the process of a valorization. So one is time and the other one is, uh, that is a process is uh, limitless. It doesn't have boundaries. So that means, and I'm going back to my topic, bodies. So that means that uh, the, we can say that the capitalist mode of production is characterized by a tension, by a conflict between limit and limitless. Limitless is the process of valorization as Marx defined it. What is the limit? The limit is uh, that uh, workers have only one body. The body is, is a kind of a limit for the capitalist mode of production. And uh, not only bodies, but Marx says also soil and nature. So if there is a reason why capitalism or the capitalist mode of production is uh, so destructive, it's not because the capitalist is evil. Capitalism or the model of the capitalist mode of production is so destructive because it is limitless. Okay, now it's time to go back to our chapters. And uh, there is a timer in, in this- Back your uh, light went off again, we think. There we go. Yeah, and, and I don't know how to deactivate this time. It's not my office. Um, I will say, yes, we can go back to chapter four, five, six, and maybe I have to speed up a little bit. Um, so chapter four, five, six are three chapters, three distinguished chapters only in the English edition for some reason. Uh, in the German edition is one big chapter. Actually in the first edition, 1867, is a, is the, is the, is the, is a long second chapter because even the first part was not divided in chapters. So what we call four, five, six as a chapters is just one piece. And in the, in the 1890 edition is the same. Uh, what you can see is, uh, is the second part that is divided in, in paragraphs, but it's one chapter, chapter four and not four, five, six. Hmm? Chapter five, Fünfstens Capital, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is what uh, in the English edition is uh, chapter seven. Okay, why is this important? Uh, it's important only for one reason, uh, that the, you have to read and you have to consider these four, three chapters as one piece, like a theatrical piece. 
Mm? There is a beginning, there is something in the middle, there is something at the end, but not the three chapters. It's a one big piece. It's a long chapter. And, uh, and the beginning is uh, the first pages of this uh, long chapter is uh, about the circulation of commodities. Marx writes, every day, every day the same story is played out before our eyes on the stage. What we can find there, this is Marx again, are economic dramatis personae, masks. He, use, he uses the Latin, and then you will see this term will come back at the very at the very end of this long chapter. What you can find on the stage is a buyer and a seller. Basically, what you can find is a equal, formally equal and juridical subject. And. <clears throat> And, uh, and when Marx introduces the capitalist, it's very coherent with what he said in the preface. He says, the capitalist, I quote, is a person or rather is a pocket. It's something that functions as a, fun functions as a capitalist. Is a capital personified? And, and this is what uh, we can see on the stage. Mm? You have to imagine this stage in which you have a seller and buyers and they sell and buy commodities and labor power is just one commodity amongst others. But then his problem is, uh, okay, where value is produced. And then in the middle, literally in the middle of this long chapter, Marx writes, something must take place in the background, which is not visible in the circulation itself. Valorization and the creation of value. So, the first dimension is the, the stage, the appearance, something that uh, is played out before our eyes. Then Marx introduces a second layer. Something must take place in the background that is not visible. And now at the, at the very end of this chapter, he abandons the surface, the sphere where buyers and sellers buy and sell their commodities, where they buy and sell labor power. And this is the sphere of the circulation that Marx describes as, a, I quote, in full view of everyone, end of course. But at the very end, last page of this long chapter, Marx moved into the hidden abode of production. And he writes, When we leave this sphere of a simple circulation or the exchange of commodities, which provides the free trader vulgaris, which is abuse, is concept, and the standard by which he judges the society of capital and wage labor, a certain change 
takes place, or so it appears, in the physiognomy of our dramatis persona. He began with the dramatis persona on the stage, circulation, formally free and equal subjects. But now he says, a certain, a certain change takes place in the physiognomy of these dramatis persona, these masks, these characters, these actors. He, who was previously the money owner, now strides out in front as a, a capitalist. The possessor of labor power follows as his worker. The one smirks self-importantly and is intent on business, the capitalist. The other, the worker, is timid and holds back like someone who has brought his own height to market and now has nothing else to expect but a tanning. I think this is a powerful ending. And, uh, and again, the structure of this book is really important because uh, if a chapter one, two, three, are about commodity, abstract labor, fetishism, money. Then you, we have a, this a part two, chapter four, five, six, one chapter, in which we can see the, the transition from circulation into production. And then we have part three and four, in which basically we see human beings with their bodies into the hidden abode of production. And you see how value is produced and how these bodies suffer because of uh, that condition. If you want, we can make a short break, or I can I can go ahead. It's up to you. Uh, I have other I don't know something like other fifteen minutes maybe or maybe less, uh, but it's up to you. No, I think it's fine. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Uh, so, as I say, at the end of this uh, chapter, the discourse becomes extremely concrete. It's no longer about abstract categories. Marx needs history. Marx needs a lot of uh, footnotes and citations from the factory report. He has to show how this system works. And, uh, and as I say, the discourse is not just about the value as abstract category. is is uh, about, and it, it's not about a commodity as a something abstract, as a, as a just exchange value. Marx is interested in a, what he calls a special commodity. In German is a specifische Ware. There is a special commodity. And this special commodity is the worker. And it's a special, I would say for two reasons. One is because labor power is the commodity that can valorize the value. This, we know this story, but it's a special because it's the only commodity that is attached to what Marx called a living body, lebendige Leiblichkeit. So labor power exists only in workers. And the labor power is a, this aggregate of a mental and physical capabilities, which exist, I'm citing Marx, 
in the physical form, the living personality of a human being. So I think this is, a, this is a crucial for many different reasons. And, uh, and it's crucial for what I said before. If, if the valorization process is limitless, and Marx actually defines this process as a limitless in chapter three, before this uh, theatrical transition into the production. So if valorization is limitless, the point is uh, if we want to address a critique of the capitalist mode of production, we should find what is the limit of this limitless system or structure or process. So the critique is in the tension between limit and limitless. And I think that tension makes the entire project, we can discuss about that, that, that tension makes the project possible. The project of a capital volume one as subtitled, a critique of a political economy. So from, 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 from that perspective, what we can see is uh, that uh, the image we had on the stage at the level of uh, circulation is false. The sellers and the buyers are no longer juridical persons, are no longer free and equals. Now, they are workers in the in the in the, in 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 the in the process of a production, and they are not equal. There is a huge asymmetries in the production. We will see these asymmetries in the in the second. And uh, and uh, and the second thing is what is exactly what I said is a is a, is the tension between limit and limitless. Um, this is a, an other citation, I think it's the last one. Uh, and this is from the end, the last page of the chapter on the working day. Uh, and you can see something similar. Marx uh, is saying now, Yeah, it must be a knowledge that our worker emerged from the process of a production looking differently from when he entered. The contract by which he sold his labor power to the capitalist proved in black and white, so to speak, that he was free to dispose that he was free to dispose of himself. But when the transaction was concluded, it was discovered that he was not free agent. That the period of time of which he is free to seal his labor power is the period of time for which he is forced to sell it. That in fact, the vampire will not let go while there remains a single muscle or drop of blood to be exploited. So what do we call freedom at the level of uh, juridical subjects, formal equality, formal freedom, laws, is no longer freedom when we take a look at this uh, workers in the, within the production. So at least there are two concepts of freedom. Not only, there is something even more. What it's not possible at the level of a circulation, the fact that this juridical freedom, legal freedom is actually not freedom. This contradiction, this negation of the juridical freedom is only visible from the perspective of the production. So for that reason, this movement from circulation into production 
is necessary in order to this unveil, unveil the mystification that takes place at the level of the circulation. And if we emphasize a little bit the term unveil, we can say that the unveil is just a translation of the Greek term aletheia, that means unveil. The thing is that the production is the truth of the entire mode of production, capitalist mode of production, because it shows that what happens at the level of the circulation is false, and it shows something more that is not visible from the perspective of the circulation. From the perspective of the circulation, you see equality and freedom. You don't see the asymmetry and the destruction of bodies. I think, I think this is the reason why uh, Marx's perspective on workers' bodies is a kind of a, is, is, is a key, is, is crucial in order to address is materialist historiography, or maybe in order to develop a materialist historiography. Um, for that reason, it goes you know, into, as I said before, into the factory reports, the archive on workers' bodies. And uh, not only archives of sufferings, but also archive in which we can find workers' resistance. Why resistance is possible or even necessary? As I say, because uh, this, is, this is the clash, this is the tension between limit and the limitless. If the capitalist mode of production doesn't encounter any limit, it's just a pure destruction maybe even self-destruction, something that we can discuss. So going back uh, uh, to the Gothic uh, imaginary, uh, the term monster uh, occurs another time, one more time in, in, in capital. But now it denotes, denotes the worker that Marx described as a converted into a crippled monstrosity by the manufacturer. The term monstrosity is, is, is not really a, a right translation because the German term is either abnormität. So the worker becomes something abnormal. And for that reason, Marx uses terms like industrial pathology, physical deterioration, moral degradation, degradation, intellectual degeneration, process of destruction. This is the terminology. Again, I want to emphasize, I want to be, be very clear about that, not because of the capital is evil, but because the process is limitless. And uh, and we have to think one something about this uh, character being limitless of the capital, maybe for the discussion. Uh, because maybe exactly in the fact that the, for the that capital is limitless, there is something quiet, attractive in the capitalist mode of production. Uh, uh, something that I think we should discuss. So, I say that uh, capital has been written thanks or because of the workers' resistance. So, we have a question to conclude. This is now the real, really the conclusion. What is, what is resistance and how resistance work. So if uh, we focus on, on bodies, we have to say first that the body is something extremely individual. We can have, uh, we can share ideas, we can share opinions, but this is my body.
Then the capitalist mode of production is uh, the cause of our shared condition. Why? Because uh, the capitalist mode of production converts worker's body into a monstrosity, into organ of the machine as a monster. So we share something that I would call is a kind of a common condition of exploitation, or you can call it a kind of a negative universality. We all are exploited, we all suffer. But my emphasis is on this negative universality. And I don't think we can do so much with a negative universality, but Again, that is, can be part of our discussion. Because, why? Because there is a third level. And the third level is uh, that there is something more, there is another form of being in common. And maybe there is a link between the uniqueness of individual bodies and something collective, something that we can describe as a social body Marx doesn't use the term social body. Marx uses the term capitalist cooperation when he has to describe how workers have been put together in a factory. And he uses the term associate arbeit, uh, associations, when he describes a different form of uh, associations of, of workers, self or, I don't want to use the term self-organization, our workers uh, have a different form of uh, being together. I, I want to explain that. Because uh, in, 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 in what, uh, what we can call a kind of a common collective social body, uh, we can see something more. What the, what the workers share is not just uh, the common condition of being exploited. They share experiences, culture, traditions, even the past in some, sometimes. So in a certain way, the social body can be read, can be read as a, the result of a double process. I use again, modern terms that you don't find in Marx, the result of, the, of, of a double process of desubjectivation and resubjectivation. And this is my really last citation, a kind of a ethnography of this association. And, uh, and here Marx is describing the associations of uh, workers in, uh, in, in, in France. What, uh, what is important, what is crucial in this, uh, in this uh, 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 citation is, uh, is that the, the togetherness, the being together becomes an end. The associations is not instrumental. These artisans, these workers, do not associate because they have to achieve an external goal. Yes, also because of that. But in the process of association, they enjoy an alternative, a different form of uh, togetherness that becomes the goal, that becomes the end in itself and not the means to another end. I think, I think in my opinion, this is, uh, this is uh, crucial. And, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, it's important for two reasons. First, because uh, what I called this double process of desubjectivation and resubjectivation is, uh, is just an expression or is the practice 
of association. It's not a theory. We can ask, why does Marx not to describe socialism or communism in the book? Because, because this is not a theory. There is no theory of socialism. There is no theory of another form of being together or togetherness. There is not a theory. This is a practice. And Marx is humble enough. I don't think he was very humble, but in any case, he's humble enough to acknowledge that in that case, workers, artisans, they are one step ahead. They, they, they are theory in action. They show us what this different form of togetherness looks like. And, 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 and where is this citation from? Where is this quote from? This is from the manuscript when Marx went to France, 1844. So he yeah. had, the, oh, oh, this is from the economic and philosophical. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, I wanted to end it with this uh, citation um, because, uh, because, uh, because I, I want to end by saying that uh, the politics in this book, or maybe the politics we need today and we can extract for this book, is not just a, a politics of uh, an anti, what I call this negative universality. There is something more, and there is a kind of a, anticipation of a different forms of a sociality. And in a certain way, Marx uh, took this uh, perspective, both of, a, of, of exploitation, but also the way workers organize themselves and they are able to reinvent forms of a sociality as an anticipation of an alternative. And, and, and this is actually the strategic viewpoint that we should adopt in order to reconsider a critique of the capitalist mode of production. That's it. Thank you so much. This is the time where there's thunderous applause. I like to mention it would be here. Um, we thank you very much for, for the Cute. talk. I want to, um, we're going to open up to questions. So if Folks want to put their questions in the chat. We will get to them. I'm going to start with a, a question. I have a lot of them, but maybe I'll ask you, um, in your reading of capital, where does the limitlessness of capital come from? Is that a kind of fiction it proceeds under? Is it a matter of law? The reason I quoted your quote on law is because you you never let people, you never let Marx um, become dogmatic even himself. And I appreciate that about you. But you could read him as quite dogmatic that limitlessness arises from the composition of capital or arises from comp competition, necessary competition. It's unstoppable until the whole thing falls apart, uh, if ever, if that's, you know, or the planet falls apart. So where do you think limitlessness comes from? And do you see the, these limits, the worker's body, there's others that he names, right? The working day, um, the organic composition of, of um, capital. How do they stop being enabling limits, let's say, of capital's drive? And how do they start being resisting limits? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, this is my understanding. So the limitless uh, in, in the book, in the text, it comes up when Marx describes the process of uh, money, commodity, money first. So it's a process in which basically the, the aim of the entire process of production is to valorize value and to gain more value than the amount of value that you put in the process. Uh, yes. Uh, then you have, a, you have a first implication of that, that basically the, the use value of the commodities you produce 
is, is, is in a certain way indifferent. What you need in Marx's terms is a, you need a better trigger of uh, exchange value. This is the only thing you need. So the, a, a capital or a capitalist in this case can produce books or, or GANs is exactly the same. The point is that you need a commodity in which value is objectified and then you can sell these commodities in order to realize more value and so on. So the, the, the use value becomes kind of an abstract in the three first chapters. Then you have this process that is just a, a, a process of, a, of, a, of a, is limitless because the only end is to increase the value more and more and more and more. But then, this is the thing, then you have a, a very specific use value. Is a use values are indifferent at the level of a commodities, there is a special commodity whose use value is not indifferent. And this is the worker. Unfortunately for the capitalist, when you buy labor power, you have the worker of this worker. Yes, you have the body of this worker. Unfortunately for the capitalist, why? Because uh, this commodity can resist. This commodity uh, is turbulent. This commodity doesn't love to be exploited. This commodity can make trouble. And, and this is where the story begins, in my opinion. So it begins at the level of uh, use values are abstract, with the exception of one use value, that is the worker, that is not abstract, and uh, constitutes a tension with the, with the process of a valorization. So you can squeeze almost everything, but you can squeeze a human being only to a certain point. Okay, that's really great, thank you. Um, let's <clears throat> open it up the chat here and we'll ask to unmute. There's a comment from Philip Wollstetter. Mark says that capital turns every limit into a barrier. I'll just read that out. But then there, are, uh, let's see, there's a question. Okay, there's mostly comments here. <laughs> Would people like to make their comments? Ter Terrell, would you like to make your comment? Why don't we unmute Professor Carver, if you don't mind. You might have to unmute yourself. Please. Ah, okay. Um, no, that's fine, happy to comment. I'm um, sorry, I got started uh, writing a lecture because there was a little discussion going on here about limits. So and um, values and how that works out in capital. So um, I very much appreciated the lecture and the discussion of uh, imagery and the um, theatrical um, uh, analogies and personifications that are going on. I think that's very, very um, helpful. The um, particular discussion uh, was uh, about why capital should go on forever, because that's kind of the uh, notion that you put out. And uh, I think Marx's angle on that is uh, that um, a value is set up to be uh, something very abstract and uh, purely mathematical uh, in a certain aspect. Uh, so it's an abstract representation of something that actually exists concretely. Since it's abstract and since it's particularly quantitative, mathematical, in fact, purely quantitative, uh, mathematical in its abstract abst aspect, um, it's um, limitless, going to go on forever. So anything that seems to be a limit or uh, barrier is going to be uh, translate um, uh, got over with um, via the um, 
limitlessness of abstraction. So this this is, you know, I mean, borrowing off of Hegel's logic and you can get the same place with Derrida, really, that is concepts so imply their opposites, they're defined by their others. So uh, anything contains its opposite. So if you work abstractly, obviously everything goes around and around like that. And Marx is, I think, really saying, that we've trapped ourselves um, through the uh, commodity pricing uh, value system into something that makes us chase abstract um, quantification and quantification is increasing without limited uh, without limits. So I think it's set up that way. It's very powerful. It ties into the discussion about uh, the, um, the monster machine and um, all the other kinds of uh, um, un unstoppable desires that he, he evokes in that kind of imagery. Thank you. Um, Max, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I think... When, 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 if if we consider a value as, as a, as abstract, and uh, I think the first, as I said before, you know, so, yeah, the first implication of that is that uh, uh, the use value, as I said, becomes a kind of a, you know, simple bearer of a, of a value, and uh, and the and the and and the implication of that is uh, that basically the process of a valorization is uh, indifferent to needs, to uh, the limitless of uh, natural resources. So everything becomes a, a kind of a, limited that is external to that process. So the point is that in itself, capital is a kind of a mechanism of a, of a self-destruction. But because there are so many limits, it doesn't destroy itself. It doesn't like, capital doesn't like the fact that there are limits. But at the same time, the fact that there are limits makes the, makes the capitalist mode of production extremely dynamic. It has to adjust the existence of limits. For example, Marx writes, uh, when there is a strike, the capitalist answer is uh, a new machine. Maybe it's not a cause effect reaction, but it's a way that capital likes to replace workers with the machine, but then it increases productivity and then it has other problems. But yes, I think we have just to consider the fact that the capitalist model of production is extremely flexible, extremely dynamic. And for that reason, it can last for very long time. What is maybe, Maybe what is the last limit that uh, capital is uh, facing now? Maybe it's the climate change. Capital can really go so far that uh, it, can it can destroy the planet. But then it's uh, not an happy ending. Right, not for anybody. No. Okay, we have a question from kind of comment question from Michael Pulsford. Michael, if you would be willing to restate it, we'll open you up. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and look, it's a, uh, I'm not trying to be annoying because I don't, um, I kind of don't really care about the thing I value in Marx is not the moral critique, but I guess I was just, um, I'm trying to draw out the, the point you're making about evil. Like the capitalist doesn't need to be evil. You're saying that Marx probably wouldn't engage in a moral critique of the 1%. And I just had a question about that. I guess like cap capital, a capitalist doesn't need to be evil to play their role. It's irrelevant. Like in the account in, um, well, they don't need to be evil in the sense of wanting to produce suffering. But it seems to me that they do in the sense of they need to be indifferent to the suffering produced by trying to get limitless value out of limited things like human bodies. 
the person who ran the you know the factory that your friend was worked in for 30 years like needed to be indifferent to the effect that it the impact that that had on him does that count as a kind of evil and to the degree that the capitalist is playing is personified capital has to act in the interests of capital um to that degree are they playing an evil role in the same way that an actor in a production doesn't have to be evil to play an evil character but within the theatrical framework and in this case in the, in the framework of production they're doing something with evil effects right yeah look i think thank you for your question i think I think we can easily say that capital is maybe more cynical than evil, but the, this is not a question. This is not the point. The point is that, uh, that it's not so useful to use moral categories in order to analyze or criticize the capitalist mode of production. I think this is my point. Uh, why? Because, uh, because, uh, because the implication is uh, Okay, so then if we use moral categories, one can ask, okay, why don't we moralize the capitalist mode of production? And Marx would have said, unfortunately, you cannot. Uh, and, and why? Because it doesn't depend on the capitalist to do what he's doing. Is is in the game because of the competition of capitals. In a certain way, even the most brutal capitalist can even can even represent himself as a good human being because he can say or she can say, oh look, at the least I giving a job to all these people that otherwise can starve. I don't buy it, but from a capitalist perspective, you know, a, a shitty job is better than no job. And uh, so this this is the thing. Uh, so it's a, it's a, I I think it's important to, or I would say I follow Marx uh, in his uh, understanding of the capitalist mode of production without moral categories because I think is uh, is is a because I think it's a, it's not it's just not possible to moralize the system. This is the this is the political implication. So another thing that is important when we read this book is that I think every single passage in this book has been written from the perspective of the possible political implication. So Marx is not just a scientist that he gives us a, a, a representation of the capitalist model production. He is thinking of the political implication of what he's saying and what he's doing. And uh, and uh, and uh, and I think yeah for that reason you know uh, it is not so politically useful to attack the capitalist as uh, an evil agent. I think that's really useful. I would add too that in your presentation the picture of labor as losing its agency. And the picture of capital is not really, the capitalist is not having any to begin with, excludes morality, which is a free act of an agent that is not caught up in a system like that. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind reading your question, this would be terrific. Oh, is that? Hello. Hi. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. I've I actually didn't know about the chapters being one chapter. Um, my question is when you talked about like the body and human being, do you mean ontologically or in recognition of kind of a difference in toil that bodies across kind of the world or different geographic areas take? And then more importantly than that, can we think kind of both of them together in, yeah, just kind of, can we think them both together in a way? <laughs> maybe, maybe one can say, it is an ontological dimension, but I don't like the term ontology so much. And I, I usually I avoid to use it. 
but yes, I think it's at the, at the level of an ontology, but, but I would put it differently. I would put it uh, in this way that, um, I can go back to that worker. So Luciano, when, when, when a worker says, I have been worked, maybe it's a phenomenological more than ontological. What does it mean when, when you say, I have been worked? What does it mean when you say, after 30 years, my back hurt a lot, I'm sick, and, and so on. What does it mean? It means that the, the process of what Marx would have called the deterioration, degradation of your body, uh, as that process went through something that is extremely artificial, not natural. It's not that your body hurts because hurts because uh, you are getting old. It's because it has been consumed. And then you have a political, a theoretical implication. So the consumption of labor power is at the same time the consumption of your body and your soul and your intellect. And not because this is a, an extremely hard factory work. I think the same thing happens in, 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 in today with the workers who have to work at their computers for 10 hours a day. What is the result? At the end of the day, there are many, many uh, inquiries, interviews with the workers who do this kind of job. At the end of the day, the meaning is you have a headache, your back hurt, and uh, what you want to do is to go to bed. Uh, so this is a kind of, this, what I'm talking about, I suppose is a kind of a phenomenology of the body that goes through this process. And I think the theoretical assumption of that is, uh, again, is this attention, this, uh, this conflict between the limitless process of a valorization and the fact that uh, we, uh, we, 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 we have to accept the fact that the body has, is in a condition of finitude, you know? And uh, what happens when you put together the finitude of the body and the limitless mode of production? This is, this is my simple question. Yeah, that's a it's an important question. It does seem like the limitlessness is not doesn't seem to sustain itself without draining uh, the life out of finite lives. That's true. Okay, I want to go to I think one more question from Liz Kinema. Liz, do you want to can we unmute you? And you'll present. Good. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's kind of in paragraph form. I'll just read it out loud. Um, because of Marx's references to intellectual activity and mental degradation, which kind of stood out to me in this presentation um, in Capital, do you think it's fair to say that he's always been talking about what Lazzarato um, and others would call immaterial labor? Um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on the, on the Fordist, post-Fordist labor distinction and whether you think immaterial labor being hegemonic makes resistance more challenging precisely because it takes place in the psyche or the mind. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, so my problem with the, the expression, this with the statement immaterial labor being hegemonic is, uh, is the term hegemonic and, and also the term immaterial. When we're talking about immaterial labor, again, there is something very material in the immaterial labor. Uh, when we're talking about the internet or communication, uh, we are also talking about two things. And we're talking about the, the, the cables under the oceans, which make this system possible and they are very material. 
and someone has to produce these things and sometimes and someone has to place these cables under the oceans and uh, so there is a materiality in the material in the immaterial labor but this is just a secondary critique my main critique is a uh, is that this is a very stagist teleological understanding of the capitalist mode of production. When you say, oh, this is hegemonic, I think, yes, maybe it's hegemonic in part of the US, part of Europe, Canada, but there are three fourths of the planet in which immaterial labor is not hegemonic. So if, even, even in California, where you find Silicon Valley, there is a central valley in which 800,000 workers are employed in agriculture. And they generate something like 54 billions of dollars. So the point is, it's not that oh, agriculture is residual and Silicon Valley is a, hegemonic, or as a Negri tried to correct his point, is tendentially hegemonic, because uh, some people from post-colonial studies criticized his Eurocentrism. So it's not hegemonic in, in three-fourths of the world. Then you can say, oh yes, but it's a tendentially hegemonic. No, I think, I think the, difficult, the difficult task is to combine the two things. I want, I want, I want to read, I want to see a theory, and, and I think Marx is almost there, that is able to combine Silicon Valley and Central Valley, agriculture and software, and how these two things work together, how these two things are combined together. So this is a theoretical political effort. Uh, because otherwise, I think it's a, just a new version of a teleological conception of history. And in the, in the 20th century, industrial labor was hegemonic and agriculture was a backwards or residual. Now, immaterial labor is hegemonic and industrial labor is a residual. I don't buy it. They, these different forms of exploitations coexist. What do we have to explain is the coexistence, not the fact that uh, one is hegemonic or will be hegemonic or is a tend tendentially hegemonic. This is my... I want to read Marx without teleology. And I think in a lot of uh, my Italian fellows, there is uh, still some teleology when they think in terms of uh, immaterial labor and what is a tendency and, and so on. This is a time to mention again, the book on Marx's temporalities, which is, is a crusade against a teleological reading. Okay, there's a couple of other um, questions. One is a comment, but why don't we do these two and then we'll call it a night. This is Philip Wolstetter. Philip, do you want to present your comment question? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, hi, Max. Greetings from Red Bay. Um, you know, I'm very uh, taken uh, with your focus on the body and this sense of how capitalism tie, you become an appendage of the mas machine, it formats your time. Uh, you know, it's a focus that I see in your work and Pastone and a lot of different people. And it's a focus away from a, a mode of attacking capitalism, which starts to establish exploitation by, by trying to trot out quantities and doing mathematical equations like so many hours are stolen each day. And uh, that seems to be right on the terrain that neoclassical economists love because it can end in some endless dispute. But when we're focusing on what happens to the body and the fact that it's limitless and it never stops, it's going on and on, which means you're going to work all your life. And if there's a, a COVID plague and you're home and you risk dying, they're going to push you to get out so you could work. It seems to me that that particular focus in Marx, and it's all there in, in, in this notion of capital as this 
kind of automatic MCM prime generator that just keeps on going and uh, you know, doesn't really care about your body. It's the skin that has labor power around it. And if it could extract that, it would do it, but it's quite happy to work you to death and have someone else. So it seems to me that your, your entire focus is a much more effective organizing angle, just in terms of trying to make people realize what capitalism is and what can't change about it, you know, which is precisely the limitlessness, this yeah. kind of Faustian drive to keep going. So, you know, it's more of a comment than a question and an encouragement <laughs> saying, as always, I await your next book, Max. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Philip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, especially after I, I published uh, Marx Temporalities, uh, I had the opportunity to go back to Marx again and again, but uh, it was more about, uh, you know, what is the political stake in this book? How we can reread this book today politically? And, and as I said, and, and I think it was pretty clear uh, uh, at the end of my presentation, I think we have a problem and, uh, and the problem, one, we have many problems, <laughs> political <laughs> problems and economic problems. But one of them is uh, that we think politics in terms of uh, anti. Once I asked my students, uh, okay, so you don't like the capitalist mode of production. Now what? Oh, we, have, we, want to, well, we want to abolish value. What does it mean? I'm serious. What does it mean? Oh, we want to stop the valorization. What, what does it mean? I really don't know exactly what it means. We don't want to produce commodities. Hmm. Yeah, why, how? So, it's, it's a, it's a kind of, so we, we have a list of things which denote the, the capitalist mode of production. And we think that by attacking all these pieces in the list of things, we have something else. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. For that reason, my, my conclusion was, uh, look, I think Marx could write this book because in the 19th century, he could see an alternative, associations, how workers organize themselves, how they organize their own life in a different way. So that was the positive thing. It's not only anti. They, they had a kind of a prefiguration, anticipation. You can call however, whatever you want, but they had an alternative in action. And that was a theory in practice. Marx has only to develop the theory that was already embodied in their practices. I think today we, we should do something similar. Where, where is now? the anticipation of a different form of life. And we have to extract theory from there instead of developing a new theory of the anti-capitalist mode of production or we, the entire humanity should be against the capitalist mode of production because we are all exploited. Does it work? Without, without, without associations, without uh, real forms of uh, workers, does it work? Then, then people start dreaming, oh, but we need a party. Okay, sorry, I become polemical. Uh, I don't want to be because I, I, I agree with, uh, with, with the Philip, otherwise people think I am in disagreement with him. I, I, I agree with him, but uh, I think we have open questions. I think today we have a much more open questions than answers. And I think when we read this book, Capital Volume One, we should find the questions more than answers. I want to give a chance for Alessandra for Natsari to ask a final question. Can we unmute Alessandra? Uh, yeah, hello. Oh. Um, so I had a question regarding the, the move from um, uh, circulation to production that in the chapters that you were you were uh, working through, um, you know, we get this move from leaving the sphere of circulation into the, the, 
the hidden abode, the, 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 the promise that the secret is somehow in the factory. Um, and, and I guess I, I'm wondering I, 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 up to what point do we need to relativize that? Uh, and I'm thinking, is circulation necessarily the sphere of mystification? And then if that's the case, what do we do with volume two, which is sort of an intensified uh, return to the sphere of circulation? Yeah, good question. Good question. Uh, there is, a, there is a, an elegant way to answer. Uh, and I borrow maybe something from Tom Bassos, who, who brought a book on time and, and in Marx's capital. One can say that there are three layers, not stages, three layers of analysis. In Capital Volume One, Marx is, is trying to understand time at the level of a production how time is crucial in the valorization process, but within production. In the volume two is understanding how time is dominating, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, crucial in the circulation and competition of capitals. And then we have a capital volume three in which Marx, Marx combines these uh, two levels. And basically, he, he, he develops, he really develops an idea of a competition of capitals. And I think this is very innovative, even for Marx himself, because, because, because when, 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 when he wrote the Grundrisse, which are, I go back to a polemical point, which are basically the text that the people who are talking about immaterial labor, love, in the Grundrisse, you don't find the competition of capital. Marx is working, Michael Heinrich, that I think uh, uh, he will come to give a paper, he, he, he wrote an article about that. In the Grundrisse, Marx is talking about capital in general. It's very abstract. It's like there is only one capital. Then in the 61-63, he developed an idea his ideas, and if he understood that actually there is not such a thing as a capital in general, but there, in general, but there are many capitals, and then he has to, to address the real issue of uh, the competition among these capitals, and this is and this is what makes things extremely concrete. So my answer is. Uh, we have to read these three books as a three level levels, three layers of analysis, in which, in a certain way, you find the the the, the concrete analysis of uh, many capitals in the world market in in the in the third volume. But it's just a you know it's a kind of a way to develop uh, is is analysis. Uh, but then, and then you, yeah, it's possible to go further, but then we go in philology because it's also true that Marx brought Capital Volume 3 before Volume 1, and, and there are many, many different issues. And then one can ask, why did he stop writing Capital? And, and, and some people say he stopped writing Capital after the Paris Commune. And then he was more and more interested in non-capitalist, Forms, forms of society. He started reading a lot on India and, and the commune and the, and the common possession in the villages, on Russia and the Obshina and me. He started reading history and the non-capitalist forms of production. Why? Short answer, because I think he, he had to understand what a non-capitalist society should look like. And the second question, how is possible to skip capitalism in society which are not organized in a capitalist mode of production? And that was a crucial question because there were people who claimed to be Marxists who thought already in the 19th century that 
it was necessary to go through every single stage. And in order to achieve socialism, first you have to be a, 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 a capitalist society. And Marx was, was in doubt. And uh, in, the, in that a beautiful letter, letter to Bernard Azulic, he said, actually it's not true. You can use the Russian optioner just in order to skip the capitalist mode of production. So uh, uh, why I'm saying that? I'm saying that just in order to emphasize one point. The project is an open project. There is no way we can read this book dogmatically. It's an open project. And I think today we should find questions more than answers in, in, in this book. And um, yeah, this is what I think. Thank you so much. That's really, it's the first, I think, hopeful presentation on Marx that I've ever heard. And I can see a whole other text there. So I really appreciate that opening up a set of positions from which to critique capitalists that don't turn capitalism, that don't turn it into a big monolith you'd have to destroy all at once, finding positions within it that are already outside of it. I think that's really hopeful. So I want to thank you on behalf of everyone who's here. This is another time where there would be plenty of applause. You'll see them, hands clapping. And um, thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your comments and questions. Thank you.